I think this year, with this exhibit, we finally got it right. When my grandson said to me, Zadie, I want to come to the exhibit, I knew, you know, I knew we struck it right. I thought I was really banning a thousand until a young lady came up to me and said, I'm Dr. Marti's daughter. Dr. Marti is a president, and here are the grandchildren. So we uh, have both our grandchildren here tonight, plus a group of other students, uh, youngsters that are here, and we really, really appreciate having that. Uh, just some minor administrative things uh, to put together. Uh, for those of you who are not on a mailing list and are here for the first time, this Sunday at 1 o'clock at the Holocaust Center in the library in room uh, LB14, uh, we're having the beginning of our lecture program for this semester. Uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Glenda Gilmore from Yale University. Uh, Dr. Gilmore's topic will be how the black press covered the Holocaust in the United States. And just to put in one sentence what she will be telling you, while the New York Times and the other papers bury the Holocaust in the back pages, the black press in the United States ran it on their front pages. For those of you who have not yet signed up, and I find it hard looking at this group to believe you haven't signed up, uh, we have our annual Holocaust Freedom Seder scheduled for, I believe, April 5th. It's the Sunday before Passover. Um, we, so far as of today, have 193 people coming. If you haven't signed up because the cutoff is 225, otherwise we have a problem with the fire department. If you haven't signed up and you wish to, please see one of the staff in the back of the room at the end of tonight's program, and we'll happy, be happy to sign you up. At this point, before going on and saying anything else, I would like to introduce the president of Queensborough Community College, Dr. Eduardo J. Marti. Thank you, Dr. Flug. And uh, you're right, we did get it right. Uh, to, uh, to have my grandkids here, to have my daughter here, it's really something that is very near and dear to my heart. Not so much because they're here, because needless to say, they come often, but because they came to see one of the exhibits in the Holocaust Resource Center. And that's what the Holocaust Resource Center is really about. Remember, our mission is to ensure that we use the lessons of the Holocaust to combat prejudice, to ensure that any time that we see any action, any bullying, any activity that is prejudicial, we stand up and we say something about it. If people had said that in the early 30s, we wouldn't have had the Holocaust. If people would have stopped the bullying the name calling, we wouldn't have had that horror. Frankly, if the world would have stood up to the massacres in Darfur, if the world would have stood up to the activities and massacres that took place during the Second World War in Nanjing, we wouldn't have had that. And I believe very strongly, as I know that you all do, because otherwise you wouldn't be here, I believe very strongly that it is through education, through the understanding of others, that we can combat prejudice. And would you believe it? When you drove in today, it's not lit up yet, but the building is finished. The Holocaust Resource Center will be there forever. <laughs> we're, we're just waiting to get the furniture to begin moving in, and we have the $400,000 to do the permanent exhibit that will be in that glass box that you see when you drive in. The only problem is that the city of New York is holding it, it's, it's, it's damning to be able to work with the city of New York, and those of you who, who work with it know what I'm talking about. We have had the $400,000 in September but you know, we have to have this permit and that permit and this permit and that permit. 
And uh, hopefully we'll have the exhibit done by the end of the spring and we'll begin having some of you come in and see it and then we'll have the big opening in September. But ladies and gentlemen, forever, forever, that building will be there. Forever, we will have exhibits like this because it's through your generosity that we have been able to raise over $2 million for an endowment. Right? That money is in the bank. Well, it's losing a little money nowadays. But that money, the principal, is supposed not to be touched. And we are only going to live off that interest. Now, we need a little bit more than that. We need $5 million to really make it. But we'll get there. I know that we will. But once we get to that point, we will be able to generate enough funding to maintain these exhibits in perpetuity. 50 years from now, 60 years from now, my grandkids' grandkids are going to be able to come here and be able to understand what, how the lessons of the Holocaust can help us combat prejudice. So this is a wonderful, wonderful project. And I have to say to you, it couldn't have happened without Arthur Flug. It couldn't have happened without Sandy Delson. It couldn't have happened without Hanny. Hanny, your last name? <laughs> Lieberman, Liebman, I'm sorry. With all the volunteers that worked for the Holocaust Center for such a long period of time. Well, anyway, I've talked too much. Let's, let's get on with the exhibit. Uh, Rabbi, another winner, thank you very much. And welcome all. Needless to say, I'm excited about the exhibit. I'm excited about the building. I'm excited about what we're doing with our 13,000 students that are going to be going through there and learning about what prejudice can really do. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marti. In putting together tonight's exhibit, um, I felt somewhat very self-confident and smug when we first came up with the idea of cartoonists and the Holocaust because <clears throat> uh, when I grew up, I had an advantage that friends my age and relatives would have killed for. Uh, my father owned the candy store, <laughs> which meant, and, and going back in the early 30s, right up to the 50s, it was a uh, predominantly Jewish business in New York, and if you had a family and you were willing to work seven days a week, 18, 20 hours a day, which we found ourselves doing, you could make a decent living and become part of the American dream as an entrepreneur. But one of the benefits I got out of that was, uh, since my dad owned the candy store, uh, I had an unlimited supply of ice cream, soda, candy, when I got older, cigarettes, uh, but an unlimited access to comic books. And the only restriction my father gave was you can read all the comic books in the store, don't tear them and don't stain them, we have to sell them to the customers. <laughs> the only person, <laughs> I think back now, who objected to this was my mother. Uh, she believed very, very strongly that reading was important. But if you read, you read from a book. It had to have a cover, with a title and page after page of typed lines. No big books with pictures, no large pictures, and no small words underneath. And from time to time when she found me reading a comic book, uh, she always had the same response. She said, put those damn books away. You're not going to learn anything. You'll grow up. You'll become a dummy, and you'll never have a job. Well. <laughs> I didn't listen, and I guess now it's more than 60 years, she would be absolutely s shocked to see I have a job. I'm here as director of the Holocaust Center. And, but she would probably be outraged to learn that here we are tonight on the campus of a college, and my job right now is to introduce our scholar in residence and the curator of this current exhibit, Rabbi Isidoro Eisenberg, whose topic will be comic books. Rabbi Eisenberg. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Fluke, for this wonderful introduction. I want to, first of all, thank you so much uh, to so many people who have become, in the course of time, part of uh, the Holocaust Research Center, coming to the openings of the exhibits and the other activities that take place and that we plan. People that I've seen from uh, every couple of months because we meet here at the opening of the exhibit. Many personal friends, uh, dear friends, uh, from my uh, congregation and from other places. So it's wonderful to see you all here uh, and to accompany me as we open uh, this exhibit. I also want to thank Dr. Marti and uh, Dr. Fluke for the opportunity that is given to me to prepare and to work on these exhibits. And uh, uh, I did not coordinate with Dr. Fluke as to, uh, nor do we ever coordinate what he's going to say and what I'm going to say. But somehow, what I was thinking of saying dovetails on uh, what he said. Uh, contrary to, uh, and as I was sitting here listening to him, I, I said to myself, wow, was he lucky? Can you imagine being the son of a, of a candy store father who has all the magazines out there and you can just go over there and read them and be, it's okay, be careful, you put it back, don't stain them, we have to sell them. But to have access to them, I had no access to comic books. Not only didn't I have access to comic books, to be, to be fair, to be honest with you, we didn't have the money, nor would my parents dish out the money for me to buy comic books. Secondly, comic books certainly in the, in the mid-40s were not for Jewish boys to read. Uh, you just, this was not part of the home in which I uh, grew up. Uh, Superman, Batman, it, we, we would kill to have one of those magazines that we could read. And indeed, I remember down the block where uh, we lived in, in Buenos Aires, as you know, I was born in Argentina, uh, and I remember the name and I, the, the family, and I remember the name of, of, of the young boy, and I used to sneak into his home, and, uh, uh, and while he was doing something else, he had all these magazines, and I would read them. And sometimes I would even uh, gun if one, you know, I would steal one and put it under who knows where, come home, and when my parents wouldn't see, I would be reading Superman. Now, remember, this was the, the 1940s. Uh, yes, I was uh, uh, at that time about six, seven years old, and uh, I was dying to read these comic books. Everybody was. But after a while, the, that's it. Uh, I grew up, and, and comic books were not anymore part of who I was or what I was reading. My parents, my mother particularly, would push read the books. That is, the, the small printer. She would get the books to me, and I would read them, right, in Hebrew, in Yiddish, in Spanish. No matter what it was, it was always books, but not comic books. And as a, one of the, our friends here uh, said to me earlier this, this evening, we never imagined that you would be into comic books. Uh, knowing you as we do for so many decades, we didn't think that you would get into comic books. I must confess to you, neither did I. But in the course of reading and uh, being involved in, in the research for the Holocaust Center and putting these exhibits together, and reading many times books that have nothing to do with the theme or the subject that I have in mind or that I envision working on, something hits me and I say, hey, just a minute, uh, look at this, I, can, I cannot believe it. Uh, oh, I have to look into it. And I start looking and I start researching and I start, and then I say, you know, this is something that uh, it makes for, for, for good material for an exhibit and certainly to teach, and to teach not only the older folks, but to teach younger folks and teenagers and children. And so that's how I came about comic books and the Holocaust and Nazi Germany. It never crossed my mind. I always knew, by the way, I always knew that Superman was created by two boys, two Canadian boys, uh, Joe Schuster and, uh, and uh, Jerry Siegel. And uh, then were sort of nebbish. Uh, they looked like Clark Kent. Uh, it, well, that's how they. That's what they did. Uh, you know, with glasses, and uh, and they create this this Superman 
at the time, right, when you say to yourself, well, we need somebody really who can fight evil. And so all these characters that became famous in the course of the generations were all the, the different, you know, there is, there is an, there, you'll forgive me, this is very much part of me, uh, there is an Yiddish uh, statement which I'll translate, it's the Zelbe Yente Antes Verschleider, which means it's the same woman but with a different dress. So all these heroes that you look upon, right, were all, I mean, I hope I'm not such a maven on the cartoons, but they were all meant to fight evil in one way or another. So they are heroes, they are super people. They can do the kind of things right, that normal human beings cannot do. And what is their goal and their purpose in life? To fight evil. But I never imagined, right, growing up, that the seed that brought these authors and cartoon makers, many of them Jewish, to get into cartoon art, was in order to fight the evil that was coming upon Europe and the Jews especially in Eastern Europe in the early 1930s. Uh, one of the other great experiences in working with, uh, in, in preparing for these exhibits is not only coming across the literature, not only coming across the text, doing the research on the books, on the, in magazines, in, in archives, uh, I went to look at the New York, just to give you an idea, New York Public Library on 42nd Street has Look Magazine. Remember Look Magazine? I remember Look Magazine. Regretfully, they didn't have the hard copies. You can only look at it in a microfilm. And it's so very interesting to see what Look was publishing in the, in the early 40s regarding the war and the, and the Holocaust and what kind of cartoons I would have wanted to include one or two of them, but there was no way I could get my hand into a hard copy in, in, in order to get it included in, in the catalog. And another aspect of uh, working in, in these exhibits, and this is not the first time that it happens to me. Uh, I, I remember uh, those who were with us from the first exhibit that I had the privilege of preparing, which was about Sosua, the little place in in the northern coast of the Dominican Republic, and, and I used a stamp uh, in the cover, which has uh, of these four or five little girls that were German Jewish refugees in the Dominican Republic. And we, we pull out the catalog, and then a month later, the phone rings at home. It says, this Rabbi Asimer, says, I say, yes. She says to me, I'm one of the girls on the stamp. Another one died, the other two I know where they have. I'm one of the girls on the stamp. Now, this is, if you think of it, I say, how did you, she lives in Florida. Well, because somebody here gave it to somebody and to somebody and to somebody, and that third or fourth somebody somehow saw it and said, oh, I know somebody from the Dominican Republic, sent it to her in Florida, found out what my phone number is, and called me, and we established a relationship and has been Wonderful to know. I mean, imagine you pick up a stamp that has that was issued in, in, in 1952 or 1953, and you have four little girls, and who speaks to you? One of the of the of the little girls that is on the stamp. Something similar happened uh, with this uh, in preparing this exhibit, and uh, and I get a, a call. Uh, Dr. Fluke tells me from the office here that somebody called, and she says that she is the daughter of um, one of the first cartoon artists and one of the first to tackle the Holocaust head on, and that was Charles Biro. Is Mrs. Ortel here? She's not. Okay. She told me that she, she would try to make it. But anyway, we had a, a, a long conversation, and uh, uh, just to, to think that I was speaking to the daughter of one of the pioneers, really, in cartoon art, and in cartoon art that dealt head on, head on. And you will see it is one of the first uh, uh, comic books, Daredevil Battles Hitler, where he 
uh, Charles Biro uh, painted these cartoons and wrote the text with another uh, author in, in, in putting this uh, uh, cartoon book out. So uh, it has been a, a joy, uh, has been a learning experience. I hope that all of you will learn a great deal from what you see, the catalog, uh, the exhibit itself. And as always, I will be ready, but I'd like to say that, of course I can be reached uh, through the Holocaust Center. If anybody else has any ideas, thoughts, comments, I would be happy to hear them. Just contact the Holocaust Center. They are in the, the office is in contact with me and I will be more than glad to respond to you. So uh, enjoy and thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, we have, in this unusual field of expertise, we have a comic book expert with us tonight. Uh, I was very, very surprised in doing it, and when I began looking for someone who could possibly be in this very, very unique field, I went online with Rabbi Eisenberg, and we put down Holocaust comic books. And the first hit we got was Rabbi Simcha Weinberg, who wrote the book, Up, Up, and Ive. Okay, a typical Jewish Superman, Up, Up, and Ive. And I remember as a kid having a towel tied around my neck, going up, up, and away, like Superman goes, but we found a Jewish approach to this. Rabbi Simcha Weinberg would up, up, and Ive. Let me tell you a little bit about Rabbi Weinberg. Rabbi Weinstein, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Rabbi Weinstein is internationally known best-selling author. His first book, Up, Up, and Ive, How Jewish History, Culture, and Values Shaped the Comic Book Superhero, received the prestigious Benjamin Franklin Award for the Best Religion Book of 2007. His second book, Shtick Shift, Jewish Humor in the 21st Century, was published in the fall of 2008. He's appeared on C CNN and Showbiz, Tonight, and NPR, and has been profiled in many leading publications, such as the New York Times, the Miami Herald, and the London Guardian. Uh, Simcha Einstein is an ordained rabbi, chairs the Religious Affairs Committee at New York Pratt Institute, and he is the founder of the Downtown Brooklyn Jewish Students Foundation, an educational and cultural center that strives to ignite Jewish pride. Um, absolutely amazing that someone would write this. Uh, my literary hero at this point, and uh, <clears throat> Rabbi Weinstein, please come up. Fifteen minutes, I, fifteen minutes, I, um, fifteen minutes, a rabbi, okay, I, I'll, I'll start with a joke, um, I wasn't going to tell a joke, but uh, it's a very heavy topic, so I think it's good to uh, start with some humor, rabbis like to tell jokes, so the story goes, it's not easy to be a rabbi and pay the bills, it's truly not, especially in 2009. Uh, as well as being the rabbi to Pratt Institute, I have a part-time job as the rabbi to Long Island College Hospital. And I go 10 hours a week, and I deal with all of the needs of the patients. And the story goes, I walk into a room one day, and there are three guys in three beds with three different degrees of injuries. And I go over to the first guy, I introduce myself, I'm the rabbi, how can I help you, what happened? He said, Rabbi, have I got a story to tell you? I said, please share your story. He said, Rabbi, I never totally trusted my wife. And, you know, I come home one day, and I like to wear Izumiyaki, and I could smell in the bedroom Kelvin Klein. And I see hanging onto the balcony of the bedroom is a man. He said, Rabbi, I was livid. I ran to my toolbox, I grabbed a hammer, I ran out onto the balcony, I started smashing away at his fingers. He falls 32 stories to the ground, lands in a bush, gets up, brushes off the leaves. It's a miracle, not a scratch. 
So, Rabbi, I'm going crazy. I ran to the kitchen. I schlepped out the refrigerator and I threw it onto his head. In my agony, I had a heart attack and here I am. I said, okay, have a nice life, goodbye. I go over to the next guy, introduce myself, I'm the rabbi. How can I help you? What happened? He said, rabbi, I just don't get it. I work as a window cleaner. <laughs> it's, a, it's a smart crowd, an academic. I'm busy cleaning windows one day. I slip. I'm holding on to the balcony for my life. I see my savior coming in to help me. The Meshuggah grabs a hammer. He's smashing away at my fingers. I fall 32 stories to the ground, land in a bush, brush up the leaves. He throws a refrigerator onto my head. I said, okay, Rufuish Alema, get well soon, have a nice life, goodbye. I go over to the third guy who looks terrible. I say, I'm the rabbi, how can I help you? What happened? He said, Rabbi, I was the guy hiding in the refrigerator. <laughs> um, <laughs> not sure what the joke means, but I, I'll begin with a confession. I'll begin with a con not that rabbis usually confess, but uh, I'll begin with a confession. You know, unlike many of my rabbinical colleagues, I did not grow up Hasidic, Orthodox, religious. I grew up normal. Uh, I'm, <laughs> for want of a bet, I'm from Manchester, England. In fact, your very own Mark Twain visited Manchester, England. He wrote in his travel log, he liked to spend the last remaining days of his life in Manchester because he feels like it'll make the transition to death easier. <laughs> Thank you, Mark Twain. Um, in fact, for me growing up, religion was really a, a spiritual valium, that something that others needed to get questions to existential issues in life that really had no questions. I have a degree in film history, and I worked for many years in the film industry. I worked in a very small uh, independent British movie called The Full Monty, which did very well over here. <laughs> I was behind the camera. I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, I also worked on the Spice Girls movie. Um, in case you're wondering, they really are as dumb as they look. Um, and today I work as the rabbi to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And when I first became the rabbi of Pratt, I spoke about all of the traditional rabbinical shtick, classes, holidays, kosher, the Sabbath. And the students would say to me, you know, Rabbi Simcha, you're very funny. You're very charismatic, you're very handsome. Um, that, that wasn't a joke. Um, they'd say, you know, it's obvious you work out, you're well-toned, that was also not a joke. Um, but this is proud, it's academia, it's different. So I started to talk about the pop culture of my youth and really merge, you know, the cultural with the, uh, the theological. And that's really the, the basis for the book, Up, Up and Ive. It's uh, a bestseller, we're now in our third print. And what I'd like to talk about for the remaining minute uh, is why Jews are so heavily involved in comic books. It's a little known fact that if a person's name ends in man, they're either Jewish, Lippmann, Feldman, Goldman, or a superhero, Batman, <laughs> Superman, <laughs> Spider-Man. Um, but in truth, it's actually a fact that almost every single superhero who has captured the imagination of the world for the last 80 odd years is the creation of a Jew. It's an incredible thing. And let's ask the question, why? If we go back to the late 1930s, it was a particularly anti-Semitic period in American history. If you were a Jew with serious artistic aspirations, it was very hard to get into advertising. Comic books were a joke, they were the lowest rung on the artistic food chain, and there was no barrier of entry. The door was wide open. We'll begin with the world's first superhero, 1938, Action Comics number one, the creation of two Jews from Cleveland, Ohio, not Canada, they began in Canada. Uh, Jerry Siegel and Joseph Schuster came out with Superman, and the comic was a runaway bestseller. And if you think the Jewish influence of Superman is forced, and if you think that I've come here tonight to preach and sell you a book, then you're right. But there can be no bigger influence of 
Superman's Jewish credentials as me going into the archives. And Action Comics number 2, 1939, you have Clark Kent goes to an unnamed European locale. It's clearly a thinly veiled metaphor for Germany. He meets Adolphus Runyon, who ties Clark Kent up in an ancient pillared room. He knocks down the pillars and cries, a man named Samson once tried to do this. Here you have young Jewish immigrants tapping into a storytelling tradition rich in biblical archetypes. And amazingly, the Nazis themselves were intimidated by Superman. Das Schwartz Corps, the weekly newsletter of the Nazi SS, wrote in April 1940, and this is unbelievable, they wrote Jerry Siegel, and I'm reading word for word, is an intellectually and physically circumcised chap who has his headquarters in New York. The inventive Israelites named this guy with an overdeveloped body and an underdeveloped mind, Superman. As you can see, there is nothing the Sadducees won't do for money. Woe to the American youth who must live in such a poison atmosphere and don't even notice the poison they swallow daily. Unbelievable quote. It's rumored that Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda, actually denounced Superman, a Jew, in the presence of Hitler. And that's actually a historical uh, fact. And Superman was not alone. Followed in 1939 by two Jews, Bob Kane, Bill Finger from the Bronx, with their creation, Batman. I just spoke at Comic Con two weeks ago with, um, I spoke with the creator of the Joker, actually a young, not young anymore, Jerry Robinson, um, who created the Joker. And it's interesting, he told me that even though we think the Joker comes from Gotham City, Jerry was actually a student of Columbia. He was holidaying in Grossinger's kosher resort in the Catskills, where he met Bob Kane and was offered the job to work on Batman. So actually, the Joker comes from the Catskills. Incredibly, the year later, Captain America comes along by two Jews, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, born Jacob Kurtzberg. And what's interesting is Captain America was the first comic to openly engage in the war. The first issue of Captain America number one is an incredible image. I saw it uh, in the brochure for tonight's event and for the exhibition. It's unbelievable. Here you have the, f the first cover, Captain America smashing Hitler across the face, knocking him to the ground. It's very cute and it's very funny, but could you imagine what a powerful personification of wish fulfillment this must have been for young immigrant Jews who were getting wrenching letters home from their families in the old country to be able to take the fight to the Nazis through comic books. It's incredible. And we can learn many things from these golden age comic book pioneers. We can learn the idea of wartime motivation. It's been said that one in four Allied soldiers carried a comic book in their back pockets. It brought motivation, it brought excitement to thousands, if not millions. We can learn the idea of the superhero being an allegory for the immigrant Jewish experience, how many immigrant Jews came to America, wanted to fit into the golden Medina of America, changed their names to become more American, and wrote about characters who also changed their names, who also had double identities. It's interesting, and I'll get a little bit controversial here, that, you know, if you think about it, Superman is, the rabbi's getting nervous, Superman is, you know, he's like the, or even more so, Captain America. He is the American, there's nothing more American than Captain America. His costume is the flag brought to life. He is all American. But if you think about it on a deeper level, he's not all American. He's actually the wish fulfillment of what it means to be all American through the eyes of Jewish immigrant artists. However, it was such a beautiful portrayal of what it means to be all American that mainstream America adopted the fiction as the reality. I really believe the argument could be made if you look into the establishment of the Hollywood studio system, so much of comedy, theater, 
so much of the arts in America, the American dream is a Jewish invention. I'll leave now if I get in <laughs> trouble. Um, I have a whole two-hour presentation, but I think we'll, uh, we'll move forward. Uh, in the 1960s, comic books became um, less about double identities. They were more comfortable in their superhero spandex skin, just like Jewish people in the 60s are less reconciling what it means to be American and what it means to be Jewish. Incidentally, my favorite superhero from the 60s is Spider-Man, the creation of Stan Lee, born Stanley Martin Lieber. I'll give you the Jewish credentials very quickly. He grows up in Forest Hills, Queens. His middle name is Benjamin, and he's entirely motivated by guilt. Um, and I spoke, I spoke to Stan Lee, the creator of Spider-Man, and he told me that the guilt of Spider-Man, in case you don't know, I'll just give you the background, um, Spider-Man is using his powers frivolously to make money, and while he's out wrestling, his dear Uncle Ben, who's a surrogate father to Spider-Man, dies, and Spider-Man is forever saddled with this guilt. And Stan Lee told me on the phone, he based the notion of the guilt that Spider-Man experiences on a post-Holocaust sense of guilt that so many Jews have growing up knowing that we couldn't have stopped happening what happened. It happened anyway. It's something that tortures us. It's something we have to live with. It's a very painful thing. Now, in the 70s and 80s, something happens to the superhero. The superhero gets a little bit serious. If anyone's been to Barnes & Nobles lately, the biggest section in Barnes & Nobles is the graphic novel. It's growing and growing because essentially we have no brains anymore. And no, really, I mean, we're totally, I have a whole book about that. Um, but, you know, the, the comic book allows us to educate through pictures. It's a very powerful medium. It makes sense that the 9-11 commission should be sold now as a graphic novel. And what's interesting is that we're now in an age of, of um, Art Spiegelman, who won the Pulitzer Prize for the graphic novel Mouse, which tells the story of the Holocaust through the allegory of mice and cats. And it's incredible. Who would have thought that when Siegel and Schuster were designing Superman on the underside of their parents' board, that comic books would be winning Pulitzer Prizes today? The Library of Congress boasts over 2,000 comic books. I just want to end off with perhaps something a little bit interactive. Because since I wrote my book, there's been a very big debate in popular culture. And I was on many television shows and radio shows, and the big debate seems to be, is Superman Jewish? And I'm gonna give you the Jewish credentials very quickly, and then we're gonna put it over to the audience. Is Superman Jewish? Uh, well, firstly, his creators, Jerry Siegel, Joseph Schuster, were Jewish. In fact, they have said that Superman was based on the story of Moses. And now I'll get very rabbinic. Watch the Moses story, the little baby Moses, as Egypt faces implosion. Baby Moses is put in a reed basket, and he's pushed away down the Nile. He grows up in a foreign land, a foreign culture, the palace of Pharaoh, and becomes the savior of humanity. What's the story of Superman? Baby Superman, called Kal-El, which is incidentally Hebrew, means the voice of God or the vessel of God, is put in a little rocket ship pod. He's sent away to Earth. He lives in a foreign culture, a foreign land, grows up in a Midwestern cornfield with the Kent family, and becomes the savior of humanity. He's compared to Samson. He's compared to Golem in many places. Incidentally, when Superman was on the shelves in the 30s and 40s, many Jewish children were being sent away in kinder transports to live in safety from the old country with families in England. The story was actually happening for real. So I'd like to put the question tonight, is Superman Jewish? What's the, uh, what, what are the esteemed panel? What's the, <laughs> Madam, is, it, what is, is this a majority vote? Or? It's all on you. It's all on you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I got a yes. Okay. So no one knows more about this topic than I do. For the simple reason no one is as dumb enough as to spend as much time thinking about this as I have. Um, so just to end off, 
the question, is Superman Jewish? I think the answer is a very strong, obvious, resounding no. <laughs> Jews are not superheroes, and superheroes are not Jews. And you should be very careful when you invite rabbis with beards as long as mine to come into a place of academia and preach through pop culture. It's tacky, it's trite, it's not cool. However, I think there's a very powerful lesson. There's a Jewish cultural ownership of many of the superheroes, a beautiful thing. And I think it's, it's a story that needs to be told. The Jewish influence of comedy and theater and television and film is well known. The Jewish influence on superheroes is not well known. It's something that needs to be told. It's a very powerful um, story of Jewish and American pop cultural legacy. But I think the lesson that we can learn from the superhero is this. Every one of us has a double identity. Every one of us has the external. In fact, in Kabbalah, it's called the chitsonius, the external layer that wants to be like Clark Kent, fit in, blend in, be loved by everyone. I see it in Pratt every day, where Albrecht and Finch have a video iPod and have everybody love me. Every one of us has a super heroic side, a panemius, a soul, a transcendent part of us that wants to do good and be good for the mere sake that good is good. It's not easy to be a superhero. I just had a baby. Well, my wife just had a baby uh, a few weeks ago. And two nights ago, the baby's screaming in the middle of the night. And uh, my wife says, Simcha, go to the rocking chair. I get up in the middle of the night. I'm sitting there. Ten minutes later, she screams, with the baby, you idiot. <laughs> it's just... I was just sitting there. Um, <laughs> actually, true. Um, but I, I really, I really want to commend the the uh, the college for having this exhibit because bizarrely, we're living in an age where Holocaust denial is on the increase and historical illiteracy is at an all-time high, and our sense of purpose and meaning is sadly at an all-time low. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of heat, but there's not enough light. And this exhibition brings more light into the world. It's important. I commend it. I support it. I'll just end off with one very quick story. I live in Brooklyn Heights. We're one stop from Wall Street. Sadly, all my neighbors are going through a very, very tough time right now. The story goes that um, there's a little girl walking through Central Park, uh, just holding the string of a beautiful, shiny red balloon. And the balloon is hidden in the clouds. And she walks past a cynical Wall Street banker who's reading his Wall Street journal and says to the girl, little girl, what's at the end of your piece of string? And the girl says, that's easy, mister. It's, it's a shiny red balloon. And the banker says, I don't see a balloon. All I see is a piece of string. How can you prove to me that the end of your string is a balloon? And the girl looks at him with the innocent eyes of a child and says, Mister, every once in a while, I feel a tug. So in life, every once in a, every once in a while, we feel the tug. We feel the urge to be super, to transcend. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> also, um, we'd like to... Rabbi, thank you. Uh, for those of you who would like copies of the books to have them signed, uh, the rabbi will be at the back of the auditorium at the end of tonight's program. <clears throat> While we didn't print up schedules or programs for tonight, if we did, I guess the best word would say the part of the program we're coming to now is called, for want of a better word, kvelling. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that word, and I see a lot of faces saying, what's he talking about? Uh, example of quelling. Uh, yeah. uh, Mrs. Brown is sitting in the hairdresser, having her hair done, and she's speaking to 
five other friends who were there about whatever women talk about in the hairdresser, and suddenly the phone rings, and the assistant at the hairdresser goes to pick up the phone, answers it, and she yells out, uh, Mrs. Green, your son is on the phone. And Mrs. Green sits up very straight and folds her hands in her lap, and she tilts her head up just a little, and she said, is it my son the doctor, my son the lawyer, or my son the engineer? That's what we mean by felling. Okay, so we want to do some of that today, and we have three groups here that we really want to show off because these groups have put in an enormous amount of work. Uh, they happen to be our survivors, and we have a number of survivors who work with the Holocaust Center in working with our students in telling their stories. We have a group of students, uh, almost all of them are here tonight, two couldn't make it because of work commitments, but we have students who uh, very willingly, this past semester, came in eight o'clock every Monday morning, which that in itself is an accomplishment, and uh, we spent time in the Holocaust Center going over the Holocaust, talking about it, reading about it, seeing films about it, having people come in and give some information what they knew. They then spent their time studying how do you interview a Holocaust survivor, and then they were matched up with a Holocaust survivor, and they were responsible for interviewing that survivor. When the students interviewed the survivors, they came back somewhat transformed, absolutely and totally transformed. They came back with such comments as, when I got home, I couldn't stop crying. I listened to this person, and for two hours, I sat there with goosebumps. Someone told me that all her cousins, her aunts, her nieces, and nephews died in the war, and only she was left. How can that be? It was unbelievable, but I guess it happened. Another one, I asked him if telling his story doesn't stir up dreadful memories. He replied by saying, it burns like a fire inside me, but it's something I must do. Another one said at the start of the interview, I did what you said. And I said, where do you come from? And she said, hell. And I listened to her story and realized she was right. And finally, one said, when digging the graves for her murdered parents in a forest in Poland, two Polish boys hiding for the Germans found her and helped her. One said, you cannot bury these people without saying a prayer. She said she could not believe that this Christian boy would say a prayer for her people. And for that, she was ever grateful. Amazing stories that these students tell after <laughs> listening to what they hear from the survivors. And what we wanted to do tonight is to call upon the pairs of students and the survivor they worked with to come up. Now, we can't pay them, although I'd like to do that, but you know, the way budget is now, we have a problem. But the amount of effort and dedication that the survivors have presented is priceless. They have really changed the students. Many of these students come in and say, you know, it's going to be an easy internship. You come in, sit around, talk, and that's it. But they don't realize what happens until they sit down and talk to these people and get a picture of the world that they never ever knew existed. And I'd like to call up the first team, Ruth Torek, Michael Lawrence. Please come up. <laughs> Ruth will tell you she came from Auschwitz, 
Michael will tell you that he was absolutely amazed that something like that would happen. Now, while the two of you up here, now just stand over here because we have a photography and we got some citations to give you, but one of the other things we can quell about today is that the gentleman sitting on my right-hand side is a New York City councilman named Tony Avella. The reason we have him is I just didn't say it would be nice if we had a councilman to come here tonight. It would give it some real reason. Uh, but we called on him for a special reason. Uh, councilman Avella received the top 10 rating from the Human Rights Project at the Urban Justice Center last week. Now, last week was a month ago, according to this article. But Councilman Avella has done an enormous amount of work for human rights in protecting people no matter who they are. And not only is Councilman Avella a supporter of the Holocaust Center, and when I say supporter, uh, he very happily for us puts money on the table when it's necessary for us to be there. But he's not a stranger here. He's come here for several events. And Councilman, I'd like you to come up, if you would, for this presentation. Separately. <clears throat> Do you want to sit down? Can you sit down? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you, Arthur, uh, for inviting me to be here tonight and to share in the celebration and the awards for the groups. Um, what you're doing is so very important. One, for the survivors to be able to tell their stories so that we remember, and the second part is for the students to learn what they suffered through. You know, and the, the opening of this exhibit just brings, brings back memories, even for me as a child, because although I was born after World War II, I read these comic books. And I remember seeing Captain America and Superman fight the Nazis. And sitting on the dais here and thinking about this, it, it really drew me back to my childhood and thinking to myself, well, maybe that's where I got some of my ideals, that in the end, Good will always defeat evil. And I think as a child growing up reading these comic books, maybe they weren't the best literature, but they did set an example for us when we were kids. And I appreciate the fact that the museum has done this, the Holocaust Center has set up this exhibit. And I do want to congratulate the survivors and the students for this project. It is so very important that we remember what happened. Not only for the survivors and those who didn't survive, but for the future. Because when anybody's rights are taken away, when anybody is persecuted, we all are. And if we forget the past, as somebody once said, we will relive it in the future. So thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to honor. Adam, your grandmother wants you up here. Ruth asked to say a few words. I just wanted to mention that it's not. No, mm, okay, no. okay. I want to mention that it's not easy to listen to our story. I obviously shouldn't be speaking. No, go ahead. <laughs> I say it's not easy to talk about it 
It's not easy to listen to it. However, we do it for the future. We don't want any other young person, old person, child to have to endure what I went through at my young age. Thank you. Hanny Liebman. Hanny, would you come up, please? Hanny? Come on up, Hanny. Now, the young lady who interviewed Hanny, Nadia Habib, was, is, is out of town. She wasn't able to be with us because of a work commitment. But uh, I would like to introduce Hanny Liebman. Hanny is someone, and I could talk about this freely, Hanny is someone who has taken the experience she went through as a teenager in the Holocaust and, and almost made it into a life's commitment to let people know about it. Hanny never says no. Uh, Hanny is always available to speak in schools. In fact, I had someone call up, a class came in last week from an elementary school, and they said, you know that lady, I was there seven years ago, that lady with the white hair, I want to say which one. I said, the lady with the white hair, she comes from Germany as a teenager, and it was Hanny Liebman who came through. And Hanny, this is for you. Thank you. Our next team. Steve Berger. Steve, would you come up? And Neville Sandu. Neville is also one of the students who was not able to be here tonight. Uh, Steve is from Hungary, was a slave laborer, and I'll tell you one of the things he told the students, because when I look at each of the survivors we work with, one thing particular always stands out. Steve told me that he was a machinist during the war. And that's what probably saved his life and that of his family. The Nazis used them uh, working in a factory. And one day working in the factory, he broke his glasses. His glasses fell, and unlike the ones we have today that are made of a very resilient plastic, he broke his glasses and they shattered. And he went to the officer in charge and said, um, I don't have my glasses, I can't work. And he said, we'll get you one. And they took him to a warehouse and they said, you need glasses, go in there, go get them. And he went in and he said he saw thousands and thousands of eyeglasses. And he took one that seemed to fit his prescription and he said to the officer on the way out, where do all these glasses come from? And the officer said, Auschwitz had no idea what that was, didn't know something, a word that had not yet taken on the meaning that it did. But Steve always, whenever I call Steve, I say, Steve, I need a speaker. Okay, it's never, well, I'm busy today, I can't, I'll be there. He's always there. And Steve, we want to present this to you. Tony, would you like to join us? And Sandy? Yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. May I make a correction? My eyeglasses broke in the cattle car during a three and a half day ride. Just okay. I want to correct it. Okay. Can I ask Ethel Katz? Ethel, could you come up? And Paul Cavallari, would you come up?
I thought you okay. I know it's taking a little minute to take these pictures, but this is really important to these people here, especially the students. Next group, Eddie Weinstein and Max Ehrman. Would you both come up? Eddie is an escapee from Treblinka. Eddie has written a book. Eddie speaks all over the country about his experiences. Max, Max came in, and I think he was a little shy when he first came in, about speaking with Eddie and going one-on-one -on -one with the survivor to sit down. But he came back absolutely amazed that someone could have gone through that experience and still be as positive and still be as joyful as Eddie is. Eddie is another person who never, ever says no. Never, ever says no. He has spoken at Yad Vashem, and he has spoken at several colleges across the United States. So, Eddie? And I'd like to invite Alan Bim, an assistant to Councilman David Weprin, to assist in this presentation. I won't take up much of your time because this has been a long, very, very interesting evening. I am here on behalf of Councilman Weprin, and um, the only thing that I would like to add as I look around and what Arthur and Dr. Martine have done is there's a line from Wicked, the show, which goes, um, a man is a crusader or ruthless invader. It depends upon the label that's able to persist. And I think it's very fitting that this is being done during Black History Month, because whether it's the Jew who suffered atrocities at the hands of the Nazis, or the black who has suffered indignities during 200 years history of the United States, it's important that we do not try to have revisionist history and say, it didn't happen, or it wasn't that bad, and it's environments like this, as we pass it down from mentor to intern, that the truth will continue to exist. Thank you. Um, Michael John Pizzogni, and our intern and Ellen Alexander. Ellen was not able to be here tonight. Um, Ellen, uh, her story is one, it's sort of a gut-wrenching story if you look at it from the point of view of a parent. Ellen was on the kinder transport, got out uh, with her sister, and it took seven years before she heard from her mother. Uh, Ellen tells the story once when we did a presentation that living with this family in England, the phone rang and the woman who became her foster mother said, it's for you, Ellen, it's mommy. And Ellen got on the phone and she told me she was amazed at what her mother said after seven years, she said, have you heard from Daddy? Is he still alive? An amazing thing. 
Uh, Michael, you were there, you helped her with it, and we want to thank you. Representing Councilman Rory Lansman. Assemblyman. 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 Okay. Assemblyman Rory Lansman. Mark Haken. Thank you. A minute. Uh, Dr. Marti started off this evening and he spoke of the Holocaust. And he spoke of the fact that so few people opened their mouths and were courageous and took actions to try to prevent it. We're here today, we're seeing this exhibit. I've probably been here, I don't know how many times, in different exhibits. And every one of these exhibits say, never again, never again to racism. Never again to prejudice, never again to anti-Semitism. And you are here today to bear witness to that. And every one of you, I know, have said, never again. Thank you, Mark. Mark and I went to Hebrew school together. Next, I'd like to call up Lena Gorin, Holocaust survivor from Greece. Uh, Jonathan Melendez, one of our students, is working this evening. He couldn't come in, but uh, Lena, I'd like you to come up. And uh, Councilman, would you like to assist them? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lina Kasuto Goran, and I was born in Greece. When I began to talk about the Holocaust, many, many people did not know that the Holocaust happened in Greece as well as other countries in Europe. To my surprise, I said, why don't you know that it happened there as well? because nobody ever told us that it happened there. We all hear about the people in Germany and other countries in the Eastern Europe. But I'm here to tell you that my family, my mother, my father, my brother, and my sister are the only survivors of both sides of the family. The Casuto family and the Emanuel family, they all died in concentration camp. So, and many, many of my friends that I grew up with, when we came back after we survived, they were not there any longer. Thank God I'm here to tell this story. And if any of you, any of you have an organization or anyone that needs someone like me to speak about what happened to us, then I'll be more than happy to be there and I don't charge a thing, I come for free. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Where is my thing? Right I didn't expect this, but thank you so much. Jane Kybell, would you come up? Jane is a survivor with a very unique story. She was a passenger on the St. Louis. Many of you saw the movie, Ship of Fools. Also, I'd like to call up the intern who worked with her, Tatiana Halbon. Tatiana, would you come up? And I'd like representing Senator Frank Padovan, Erica Goldstein, would you please come up? Yeah. 
Hi. Um, as you guys know, I represent Senator Padavan. And one thing I want to speak personally is I had an opportunity to do a program like this when I was in high school, where I had the chance to sit with a Holocaust survivor one-on-one -on -one and listen to their story. And it's really meaningful, and it's really something that you never forget. And um, I know all the survivors, it takes a lot from you to tell your stories, and I really think you deserve a round of applause just for taking your time and taking all the courage it takes to sit and tell your story to a student who probably never faced any halfway near the hardship you faced. Um, this is a very important program to support, and I'm glad I'm here to honor you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And for now, our next group, uh, Sally Sachs. Sally, would you come up? And Robert Lovianco, would you come up? Sally is very unique. Sally's one of the toughest women I know. I thought my wife was until I met Sally. But <laughs> Sally, you can sit down. No, sit down. I Sally, I know, she's not an old lady. She's a young uh, 72 or 73. Sally, yeah, Sally uh, Ravensbrook? Ravensbrook. Ravensbrook concentration camp, was on a death march, uh, came from the town of Czestochowa, of Poland. Uh, her greatest accomplishment to date that she thinks is not that she works as a volunteer at the Holocaust Center, working with students, telling them their story. And Sally really is one tough lady. Her greatest accomplishment is that her grandson Stevie, right? I had to tell her this. Her grandson Stevie works as a legislative assistant for Congressman Gary Ackerman. According to Sally, she helps him run the country, and we really, really appreciate that. <laughs> now, Sally, just come over here so we can take the picture. Yes, okay. Tony, did you want to? Okay, let's take the picture. Let's take, let's take the picture first. Okay, Robert, there's yours. And Sally, there we go. Sally is not shy. I was very impressed. I don't know when this young man. Right. Yeah. When this young man showed up in my house. Well, Sally, talking to you. No, I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. I, you know, I talk all over. Yes. I, uh, okay. Talk. I was very impressed when this young man showed up in my house, and I asked him, "How comes you are so interested in the Holocaust?" Are you Jewish? He mic. said no. Out, out, Sally, <laughs> start over, talk into the mic. Uh, I am, was very impressed when this young man showed up in my house, and I asked him, how come you, uh, you are interested in the, Halika, the Halikas? Are you Jewish? He said no, but I'm very, very interested in the Halikas, and we talked, and really marvelous young man, very interested, very interested in the whole thing, and I thank you so much. Sally also left out that she made him lunch. Okay. <laughs> Robert, do you want to say something? Sure, sure, go ahead. I just, want, I just want to say thank you to everyone who was involved in this program, especially to the survivors who shared this story with us. It's one thing to learn about this in history class, to learn about the facts, but when you actually sit down and talk to an individual that went through this and that experienced this in their lives, that's what makes it real for you. That's what, what shows you the truth about what happened. I want to thank Dr. Flug for putting this program together year after year, and thanks, everyone. And thank you. And for the final word, uh, before you have a chance to go back viewing the exhibit or partaking of whatever refreshments there. In doing some research for this, I came across the artist Arthur Schick. Arthur, and Schick spelled S-Z-Y-K. Many of you have probably seen his work, but don't know it. 
and if art has any relationship, such as the art in this exhibit, has any relationship to the message that we should know about the Holocaust, in 1944, when Arthur Schick was in the United States, he had escaped from Poland. The Nazis were looking for him. They smuggled him out of Poland to England. In England, he learned his mother and father had been captured and murdered in Chelno. And from England, he used his art, and he was taken from England to the United States, where so much of his art was used. And his art is almost like Norman Rockwell, that type of art. His art was used to really carry the message of the evils of Nazism. Uh, in 1944, after living in the United States for two years, a reporter asked him, if you could capture Hitler, if you could capture Hitler, what do you think would be the appropriate punishment for him? The, uh, the, the possible answers could have been, we'll shoot him, we'll hang him, we'll put him in the gas chambers, we'll burn him, we'll have a mob beat him to death, we'll do any one of the horrors that the Nazis perpetrated against humanity. He came up with a totally different answer. He looked around where he was and realized that the Holocaust has a message. And he turned to the reporter and said, if I captured Hitler today and I wanted to punish him, I'd turn him into a Negro, and I'd have him live in the United States. And that's the message of the Holocaust. We thank you for being here tonight, and we hope you enjoy this exhibit. Thank you.